and share. What's good, E? What up, yo? What's, what's going on, man? How you doing, right. man? I'm, I'm good, doing, man. I'm good. Back up in Michigan. We're both good. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a lot of interesting things going on right now, man. Um, mm. You know, it's funny because um, I was talking to my uncle, and I said to him, uh, he's like, yeah, I got this app idea I want to kick around, whatever. And I'm like, <laughs> Well, it just so happens we have this show that we do every week <laughs> to talk about app ideas. And his response was very interesting. He's like, yeah, I'm not really willing to put it out there. Um, I, you know, I really just talked like, talk to my nephew about it. So one, he, when he drew the nephew card, which I thought was an interesting, <laughs> an interesting play. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it's, it's interesting seeing how some people are very down with the mission of uh, revealing their ideas to the world and then other people like to hold them close. Yeah. And why do you, I mean, do you find any difference between the, the people or do you think that there's, you know, an underlying reason why certain people don't want to share it? I feel like the cats who hold these things close to their chest are inexperienced. I feel as though mm. the vast majority of people who are not willing to come forward um, have never been through the process of building something before. Um, and th they're not cognizant of how much help you're going to need. Um, and they're not yeah, cognizant yeah. of the, the gaps that need to be filled um, to make something happen. So I think it's, I think that's, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think, I mean, if you think about the, you know, these universal truths of fear and love, I think perhaps the people that don't share their ideas are approaching the venture from a place of fear. Right. Whereas the ones that are just down to push the mission forward, let's talk about it, I think is more of a, a lean in love approach. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. I, th I think it's natural when you when you have something that you're really keen on doing. Like there's some like inner voice inside of you that's telling you to do this, you know, and to and to go yeah. scream that inner voice from mountaintops and saying like something's compelling me to do this shit is it's a big leap. And I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a bit. People aren't used to being able to do that or even having it. So it's not encouraged. Yeah, for sure. And what do you think about um, the the fear that the people have around somebody taking ta taking their idea? Like, because I think like that would be if you ask most people who don't want to share their idea why they don't want to share their idea. I bet that you know it'll be something along the lines of that, right? Yeah, yeah. I I, I feel like it's only one in. 20,000 people can execute on anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that, that person who's like very keen and built himself up to be an executor has things in motion they're executing on, right? So yeah. the chances that you have an idea that one is like such a fucking grand slam that someone's going to take it. And then on the other hand, <laughs> it gets put into the hands of an executor, which is like one, like such a very small number of them really have that follow through. Are, it's so slim, and the truth is, yeah. once there's once there's a market worth identifying, there's normally a handful of companies going after it. Like in the payment yeah. processing <laughs> world, like Stripe was one of many investments that a lot of these VCs made into that specific space. So right. you'll find, like even when you take on early venture capital, that a VC firm will will invest money into many different companies in that specific space because they see the potential in the space. Right. Mm. So, so, you know, we like, I think as, as seasoned entrepreneurs, you go into things under the assumption of competition, right? Yeah. You go into things under the assumption that there's going to be a fire under your ass and you're going to have to fucking compete versus somebody who's never been through the fire before. You think you're going to be the only kid on this island. And with the minute, you know, you start making noise, start rattling cages, other people are going to pop up. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're going to have incumbents, you're going to have new startups, you're going to have people who, you know, you're just going to have these, with the, like starting out a company with the perception of threat, I feel is yeah. 
a very vulnerable place to come from. You know, you're, you're already uh, kind of yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree. I think my my thought just flew out of my head. It just <laughs> left. <laughs> it just left. Like I. I because dude, because I was act like I was actively listening, you know, like there was something that I really wanted to say, but I just totally suppressed it to actively listen to the to the mm. length of it and then it just just flew out. Yeah, it's uh that happens, man. It, and also oh, it's big. oh, I got it. I got it. Yeah, so, take yeah it, take I mean, I mean the the thing that it made me realize is that what you're saying is that um you know, the thing that they're fearing, which is somebody taking that their idea is somewhat inevitable. <laughs> you know, it's like that, like that fear is yeah. not, it shouldn't be a fear, right? You have to embrace, you have to embrace the fact that, you know, you're not, you're not the only person on this island. And if you think you have such a novel idea, I mean, the truth of the matter is you probably like tons, of, tons of people have already thought of that in some capacity you know, in yeah. some capacity. Um, and, and then it gets to a deeper question of, you know, are ideas even property? Mm. You know, do you like, do, is there such a thing as like, this is my idea when it's like ideas are, are a culmination of our experiences, right? right? It's like they're, they're formed from our experiences. And it's like, well, is this is this our idea to own, right? Yeah. Or is it, does this idea exist as a standalone? Yeah, you know. Speaking of ideas, uh, should we let Sean in? Let's yeah. Do it. Yo. Yo, what's up, Sean? Yo, <laughs> Sean, what's up? <laughs> what's going on, brother? How you doing, brother? Yeah, not too bad. It's a little Friday morning here in Melbourne, so yeah, yeah. not too bad at all. <laughs> awesome, awesome, cool. Are you staying safe, staying healthy? Yeah, Victoria, we're the kind of the most hated state in Australia at the moment because we got the second <laughs> wave. Oh no! Mm. But otherwise, yeah, Damn. like in the grand in the grand scheme of things, it's not as bad as other kind of countries. I mean, I look at the news and. UK and England and New York and that so it's all relative but yeah we had a little outbreak where people were just um a little ignorant to how it all works and kind of having massive family gatherings and going out giving granny and grandpa a hug without like the realization like yes you can give it to family members damn wow so now there's a second outbreak in Victoria and things are shutting down yes yeah, so, I mean they've I don't know how well it's going to work, but they've limited it to like certain suburbs in Victoria. So wow. I don't know how that's going to work because people like go to gym across the suburb or like work across or go to the local like supermarket or hardware store across there. So, and then it's just human nature at its best. And people are like, firstly, there's like racism, xenophobia, sexism, whatever it is. Now it's like you there on your side of the suburb, you've got, COVID and we don't. And so, yeah, <laughs> you're <idiots. laughs> yeah. It's, it's like it's one person that's ruined it. And it's like, yeah, maybe some suburbs are like, that's more of likely to happen. But it's like people then just, it's them versus us. <laughs> it's like, For oh, sure. Just because you're on one side of a road and not the other, you're on the bad side of the tracks now. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, and how Sean, about you well guys? Welcome, welcome, man. Welcome to the to the conference room, to the whereby no NDAs. Um, yeah, yeah, we're yeah. good. We're good. So Nick is currently in Michigan, and by the way, Nick, Sean, Sean, Nick. Uh, so Sean, so I met Sean in Melbourne. Um, nice. When while he was doing the uh, Lewagon coding boot camp. Oh damn! Yeah. All right, so yeah. former student. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So we yeah. did the like January intake. Since then, they've had a part time one finishing, and then they even did one during the full on kind of COVID lockdown, purely all online and remote. So that, that's crazy to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that they're keeping it going, though. You know, like even, yeah. even though everything's going down, um, 
Like we have a mutual friend, Bernice, who just took a flight to Brazil to do it down in Rio de Janeiro. And, you know, oh. she's doing it from her apartment. Wow. Yeah, yeah. it's a tough travel. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, she, she, she got stuck country. in Lisbon for like three weeks, man. It was an interesting stitch. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, so we were we were like the last um, safe intake, I guess. Um, yeah, that exactly. Being said, I know. Like that was like the said, last in person batch. Man, possibly then, ever. like after that. Well, like <laughs> they really did well on this like digital course. Like it was a really good group, and like they managed to scale the technology and the courses. Like the wagons just set up where they record all of their sessions and that so they've got French and English who knows what other languages will be in the future but mm. yeah they did really well and like the TAs the teacher assistants would come in and help out so yeah like, I think a lot of our batch and that like really struggled afterwards because like okay now go out and network and see the world and you left with no structure it was like yeah people, for sure People love that structure of like coming into a virtual boot camp every day, like achieve more than 99% of the world, even though we achieve more than that. Most people like during the boot camp in person, but it seems like they got a lot out of that time. Whereas a lot of people are just like left feeling pretty, pretty flat and kind of confused. Mm. Yeah. It's so impressive how quickly, uh, Le Wagon responded to the situation you know just that the yeah. fact that they're running a global in-person you know boot camp and they managed to create a scalable system online and still get you know still get that same level of execution and same level of learning which is pretty amazing yeah. um, so they had their pitch night all virtual like they came into the space because it was opened up again but did it all like no crowds and cheering and oh. yeah kudos to them hell yeah uh Damn. cool all right so let me tell you kind of how this works it's not too not, not too formal no no you know not too much of a structure but really nick and i are, are we've started hosting this webcast and and looking to support entrepreneurs support creators support makers in any way that we can and, and bring value um through you know whether it's creative input strategic direction um technical things um so it all but it all starts with you telling us what you're what you're up to uh and then and then it's yeah. kind of just like a jam and a dance from there and hopefully yeah. hopefully you'll be able to walk away from this having taken some value from it and you know having maybe a clear understanding of something that you uh in question of yeah so i guess i'm pretty early on days it's something that popped into my mind post boot camp but every time i say my little elevator pitch if you will it gets more refined and or i'll completely butcher it and know not to go down that route so <laughs> every time i say it out like i kind of define the value proposition more and more but I guess my background has been from, I love physical activity and actually I love people also. Kind of combining the two has been a great part of my life. However, um, I've also moved around a lot and want to continue to do so and also learn and pick up as many activities as possible. And I say activities, like the premise of this app is physical activity. So being able to combine groups and communities and actual searching of physical activity is something that I believe and others that I've talked to are lacking out there to be able to find something that meets your requirements. And that's because I know in Australia and even America, similar cultures, the most popular physical activities are walking, running, cycling. They're in kind of the top 10. And then as you go down, what we, th what we think are like the great Australian game or the great American game, like you would see the stats of like how um, American football, like participation rates go down and down and down here. It's the same with AFL rugby. So it's, they're almost neglected. They get big media attention, these team sports and the, I love a team sport. So trying to combine that element of community in these kind of individual activities is something that hasn't been really done and it's not really incubated and shared. 
so trying to combine that, I think the first question that everyone asks is how is this different to Meetup? And I'd say um, as we're learning and going deeper and deeper into like not even your niche because these are mainstream activities, you need to be able to filter by what you want and need. And some of that is like in a hierarchy, just um, I am a, I'm a mum or a dad and I work, so I can only do Tuesday and Thursday mornings before dropping kids off or like Wednesday and Friday evenings after I actually have a moment to myself. I live in South Yarra or I live in a certain suburb. I can't take a half hour drive to get to my local training ground or a gym. So being able to actually filter based on those and then even things that make you comfortable is this an elite level one and be able to combine that and share more about your kind of coaching or community philosophies and your values. So there, there is an overlap with Meetup and it's a sense of community and belonging. But a lot of that doesn't belong and happen in actual a lot of events and team sports. So being able to share and filter out that way. One of the big things is if you go into Meetup, it works well for a very broad set of activities. But when you need to go deeper, you can't just rely on clicking through 50 little cards and say, OK, they do... Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I've only got Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Next, Google searches and giving anyone any results because it's, um, well, firstly, a lot of these are community, small time players, and even the big ones like Nike and Adidas Run Club, um, they're not being indexed on Google. It's really impossible to say, to meet those criteria. And similarly, like Facebook um, groups are a great sense of, enhancing that uh, community when in a online presence but then you can't actually find those groups unless it is south yarra running the tan run club something as ridiculous as that you can never find it so it's being going deeper and going deeper and um, being able to actually find those like-minded groups at your activity and taking away the fear because if you're scared or if you actually find a group but you're scared that they're at the wrong level not not your tribe, your people, whatever the language may be. People don't take that first step or get out the door. So trying to market it as a paid platform. And so the group owners, the one that lists it at different tiers, some of the business um, commercialization is what I'm still playing around with. I don't want to get too ahead of myself in terms of what that is and looks like. I know there are so many different models and explore what features I can add on uh, as I go. But also in discussions, it's like, is this and what I'd love to talk to you guys today and kind of part of my market research and what I need to do moving forward for a group owner is, is customer acquisition your main pain point? Some groups may be happy with the five, 10 regular people that go there. Some people are happier mm -hmm. with that and they'll pay $24 a month just to have a little meetup group and then they run it on Facebook or, or some of them big big brands that sponsor these things and it's a free event, they're actually looking for a return on investment. So customer acquisition is huge. Mm. Talking with like outdoor groups, like actually always like cycling, trail running, not just road running. It's right. Like having, having an indemnity, emergency contact um, and liability, that's their biggest pain point because if you're on a group ride and get in a crash, like who is responsible? So yeah. learning more about those things or like a, it's not a booking tool because these are normally set set activities repeat, but also mindful. I want people to come back and use the app time after time, but it's you're not limited to you've only got a set number of like mat spaces in your yoga studio or kind of reformer Pilates beds or one PT can do. That's a finite amount. These are like. Mm. the most accessible activities known to man like you can just put on some shoes and go running we know that we do better when we go running with teams or like achieving our goals around other people so how do you get them coming back and getting value from there it's maybe a bit short-sighted and having just customer acquisition to find it and then you pass them off somewhere else right. so i think that's um that's a a very big encompassing with a couple of questions that I'm grappling with at the moment. Cool. Um, so just to kind of recap, it's at the core, it's, uh, so it's, it's building community around activities. 
yeah so i think at the moment it's even finding communities around physical activities and even gotcha. more specific to that is physical activities that aren't location specific so it's you don't have to go do your hockey training or you don't have to do basketball training at a court or a swimming pool or at a right. certain oval on a certain time it's like well tuesdays were there thursdays were there that's what makes it right. so fun and accessible so right so it could be walking it could be running it could be hiking yeah so the reason they're such popular ones is because there are no barriers to entry almost but because of that wideness there are lots of groups and it's just clutter so people yeah they can't grow their group or they can't find a group that's specific whether you're and the touch part i was saying about sharing values is i know some that are very community minded and open but then some of them the one i love it's um unapologetic pursuit of performance and it's like well guess what if you are just a little casual runner putting on for the first time like don't go to that level yeah okay cool cool and um what what inspired this idea originally like why 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 are you gravitated towards this and um, what like do you have a specific pain point you want to solve for yourself or it's something that you identified uh so per, as a personal level like not being able to find a group so i've mm. um moved as well as like i used to play rugby first thing i did was mm. search for a group for a club and guess what there's one league so it's one website and then you just branch out there there's mm. no like if you're looking at running like everyone says like just put on some shoes and go running like doing it with other people in a setting is much better but like i'm not joining an athletics club running and yeah. athletics aren't the same thing so it's like there's no central body so i've struggled to find that and a riding group per se so right. that's where i do believe having a free tier but and you scale it up is really important unlike meetup it's just if you're an elite meetup group or a free one i they change their model to it's like 25 bucks a month so it's pretty steep i'd say for like just a little community group where they're only charging like 50 bucks 100 bucks a year yeah for completely free and then you get like coaching wow so. okay okay and the mm, go, go for it Nick. no keep keep on keep on raveling the yarn ball man keep going oh no i was just gonna ask if these community owners um are they saying okay well i'm creating this community right the, the people that are starting the community i'm creating this community and we're gonna go mm -hmm. running on tuesdays and thursdays from the, these times and so yeah. i as a person kind of coming and looking to find a community i can say ah that seems to fit with my schedule and i'm really resonating with those values i'm going to join so basically yeah. the question is, is it's the community owner who sets those intervals and activities yeah so it's like okay. but how do people find their schedule schedule little yeah. and like if you like and i am kind of wanting to focus on that community aspect and it's like and there are bigger aspirational things and like um even talking about like what is an lgbtqi or kind of like female friendly group and all of those things like yeah. getting down to like those right. niche pain points but it's like it's, it's not just like every group is the same it's like I'm, I'm staying away from the word tribe but like the thing that people talk about is like what's your tribe it's like yeah. who are your people so there's that but yeah it's pointless if guess what i'm a I can't go on a Monday, so guess what? I'll do the next best thing that meets those like filters. Right. Okay. Well, I think, dude, I think the, um, I think the concept is awesome. I'll just yeah. say that, right? Like, I think the concept around building tribe, you know, or community, building community around activities, right? Simply yeah. is, I think, a powerful concept. Um, yeah. So it is. Um, it's pretty much Nick, you wouldn't know this, but it's like straight out of the wagon demo day. It's a marketplace. Like it's a many to many relationship. It's mm -hmm. as like, it's a transferable concept on anything. And like, even looking for a shared working space, I'm in inspire nine, like 
there's a platform that like you go list your shared working space and it's like uh oh, instead of like values it's like uh oh, private meeting rooms um it's like mm. boardroom tables it's like what are those things like not every working space right. is the same and not every activity group is the same so being able to search deeper rather mm. than just this wide search mm. Yeah, well, it's interesting because what you're kind of doing is you're unbundling the existing Facebook groups, right? Like there, there's going to be a group of Facebook mindful photo photographer runners in your area, right? That you have yeah. all these little niche communities um, all focused around this concept mm -hmm. of we're going to do some level of activity in a novel way. So what you really want to focus on is, you know, how do you build software on top of those existing groups, like the Facebook groups, the Reddit groups, the people who are very keen to get themselves dirty in, the, in this way. Um, one of the interesting models I've seen recently is a uh, platform called lunchclub.ai. So it's um, a invitation only network where you can come on and it basically asks you, hey, do you wanna meet an interesting entrepreneur from your area? And I think it's very interesting because, you know, schedules do shift, especially in COVID, right? Where every single time there's someone within my desired category of person based in Los Angeles who is a software engineer, is an entrepreneur, is interested in spirituality. When that person pops up and available, they actually shoot, shoot me an email saying, hey, are you interested? Right? And so it's a constant conversation with the platform to ask if you're in. Right. Because that's kind of what that's kind of like the way I used to think of it. It's like I like doing acro yoga. So it wouldn't be far fetched for me to say, hey, let's organize an acro yoga class and then go into this platform where, you know, I don't have to like pull people from Meetup or like say, hey, join this group. It's like I can then pop on, pay a fee, and then tap into all the, the yogis in my area to potentially get a viable group together. That's the way I imagine using it. And I would pay money for that. I mean, the prospect yeah. of organizing around the community. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would too. Because I think the two interesting pillars to me that stand out are um, the, the values, right? You say like, because that gives something for people to resonate with and gravitate towards. And yeah. then the, the scheduling, because that makes it tangible and actionable. Um, yeah. So I think like those are two interesting pillars. And I think those two pillars alone are a differentiator from anything similar to meetup, right? It's like zoning in on those two aspects because the, the values and like the niches of the groups, it'll just allow sh the strongest communities to form by, by placing values in that conversation. And then the scheduling bit is also gonna be, you know, part of your, your value proposition, right? Your unique yeah. value proposition is gonna yeah. be um, th that piece of t that, just that tangibility, right? Of just like yeah. here, we have this community, we're on these values, but I do, I will say that, um, yeah, I, I mean, is there, and this is more of a question, right? It's like, is there, you know, you try to build something for everybody, you build something for nobody, right? And so like yeah. with, with, by opening it up to all physical activities, do you think that every physical activity has the same requirements in terms of like, you know, meetups and, or time or locations or like, is that something that you found to be consistent across activities to a, to a, to a place where you feel confident enough to roll it out for all activities? So to begin with, it's very much a focus on um, running, walking, cycling, because those are, mm unlimited kind of physical yeah. location. So the location barrier is a whole lot less. And based on kind of, um, I've done two of those <laughs> extensively, not so much the walking, um, I mean like bushwalking and like outdoor activities, definitely something that I've done, but not in a group activity. I see it all the time, so it's pretty transferable. They may have a different requirement list. Uh, yeah. But yeah, keeping it locked down to those two, and it's because yeah. as soon as I start going into gyms are a big one or like your CrossFit or, the, or like comparing it to say a CrossFit or a yoga studio, they can only have mm -hmm. 20 people at one time. So they go into mind body 
and you have to make your reservation. If you don't go, you get a black dot to your name. Whereas this, one of the things I'm trying to overcome is you don't want to force someone's hand into going onto this app or like site every time to register for it. It's right. a bit of overkill, I think, and it's maybe a pain point that someone uses. Eventbrite, you can scan people into your events, but these are like very low impact. It's like you pay an annual membership and guess what? Come along to as much as you can. And there's no kind of, well, you don't have to worry about coming into like our gym, our facility. It's like we've got nature. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. So it's trying to figure out like, okay, these have those... Yeah, lack of barriers is making it so accessible, but having an abundance means nothing gets found. Um, yeah, so trying to grapple with like, okay, if you're a gym, you pay someone to go, like you pay an app and that's your booking or schedule tool. And then that like syncs up with your calendar, all of those things, which we could easily do. Um, not an MVP kind of requirement, but how do you build value on the platform where you don't require people to come back and make a booking. It's like literally I go to the same running group every Thursday for an entire year or every Wednesday I meet at that cycling group. It's like, how do you build a brand where you're just finding something? And then I'm not trying to compete with meetup. I think has done a terrible job at um, building communities online. They also say their mission is to build physical communities. Like their discussion tool does nothing. It's like, what's the zoom link or, I missed this as they're recording. That's the community building. So it's to be able to find a community and then you pass it over to Facebook, pass it over to the physical interactions. It's like, does that mean there's enough, enough of a presence and then actual like enough of a value to, to monetize? These are the questions I have to answer myself also, but like, how do you make the tool a little more sticky? <laughs> like getting people to use it click through is it blogs articles what what it may be well i you know a, a thought occurred to me as you were walking through um trying to f figure out what that model looks like um i have a big hypothesis that i think will be especially like during covid is a lot of these trainers a lot of people who have the networks to lead these sort of groups and the skill set to have you know a biker group or a running group or x y and z you know, they're looking for new opportunities to take that hobby or something they're very passionate about and turn it into a job. So mm -hmm. one of the things that occurred to me when you were walking through it is, you know, one of the things I, I'm trying to think of is, you know, what's a splitting head migraine with what you're doing? Like, what is something that is keeping people up at night and everything feels like it's very community focused, it's very soft. Like, it's not solving like a very hard problem. With yeah. that said, one of the like general um, splitting head migraines, I, I know a lot of people are passionate, especially about fitness and a lot of other things, is how do I turn this into a job, right? A lot of people do the yoga teacher training, they'll take these steps to turn it into something that's viable, and a lot of them are, you know, what you're describing to me isn't only, um, you know, places where the location differs, it's also, like what you said, there's no centralized hub, right? There's no go-to strategy of, I, I love running, I love cycling, and I love walking, how do I transition this into a sustainable business? That's something that I haven't seen done before. And I could even imagine this being a place where I can go on and create my own group, right? That's paid and have people on a weekly, uh, monthly, annual subscription to subscribe to the opportunity for, for me to lead those groups. Because dude, I know the best hiking spots in Michigan. I spent yeah. three months, I'm not fucking with you, literally, in a float tank and hiking all of southeastern Michigan. You know, if I could like organize one, say, um, you know, hikes for entrepreneurs, where it's like on a bi weekly basis, I, I would charge 300 bucks a month for that. I think it would be worth yeah. it. Yeah. I think and that's I think, maybe. Sorry, go on. No, go for it. I was just saying, like, maybe I am trying to, like, I say I'm, I talk about finding a niche, but maybe I am still going too broad, like, that's the niche, like people that want to scale and professionalize and monetize. And like talking to my sister, who's like very much um, on the socialist <laughs> spectrum, she says like, oh, I'm worried about like, but she's like, I hate that meetup started charging. And it's like groups and it's like a lot of them are like balancing that. Yeah. When I say community, there is a difference between like, like a big selling point and 
is like I believe in the physical and emotional benefits of one exercise and two like actually having a community. So it's like something that like I have to come to terms with maybe like if I'm not charging and people aren't charging them, it's like you, I believe you can put a dollar value on value, a dollar figure on value. And it's yeah, like, and then scale to that because otherwise, guess what? If I crash and burn and die, no one, no one benefited anyway. So, yeah, I think when, um, yeah, when Nick was making the point around that, you know, people want, you know, people may want to turn this into a sustainable business, right? When he was stating that hypothesis, it made me think about uh, Mighty Networks. Uh, so that's another one that you want to jot down. So you have lunchclub.ai, you have Mighty Networks. Mighty Networks is, it allows people to build com and host communities online. And uh, they can be paid communities, they can be free communities, right? So you have some, some people that have really strong Mighty Networks and they're getting paid simply to host this community, right? So it's kind of like if I'm, it's kind of like, you know, when I, when I think of that model, it's like recontextualizing Mighty Networks for these physical activities. You know, yeah, um, and that they have a business model that seems to be working pretty well. I'll check it out. I've got a, a tab open, and that looks really cool. I was chatting with yeah. A, yeah. a product manager friend who is, terrifies me every time I talk to him because he's very critical, but he knows what he's talking about. Like, comes with the best intentions. It's like, okay, it's not going to be the nice, fluffy, like it's great. And he's like, what are commute? What are people doing? to solve this problem already. And it's like, yeah, one Facebook groups, a lot of them are private, so they're not being found. But once you're in that community and Facebook, a lot, it is good. Like Facebook is meant for sharing crap. And like, yeah. guess what? that's what I do with my friends. I talk crap and it's like, you feel some people, it's a little, a little different. I also know Facebook's not for everyone, um, but it's like, so is that, is the migraine that is splitting migraine customer acquisition or it's like and maybe to scale it up so i think it is um yeah talking more and more about narrowing down even more as an mvp um yeah mm. especially because even because even with the model where you allow people the you know people that may want to transition into entrepreneurship with this stuff then you have them do you have them doing the customer acquisition yeah. Right, because they're incentivized to grow that community. Yeah, right. and one um, of the first things um, I don't feel like you probably remember Marty, but he's like, yeah, it's like his customer acquisition the pain point. Like, if you really wanted to scale and monetize this, like, would you just get a, a little WordPress site um, and pump it a lot of money into Facebook advertising? And it's like <laughs> that is. And like I've called my competitors meetup, um, Squarespace. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but it's like still, I believe being found is the biggest pain point for a lot of people, especially when they're new or growing or have a high turnover, which Marty talks about like his, because he's at a university. So it's just students rolling in and out. So yeah, yeah, some, some more hypothesis to test. Yeah. I, I, what was interesting was, um, yeah, you go on about like customer acquisition costs and using Facebook growth marketing. Um, it's a pretty common tactic, but I feel like based on it's just funny the niches that you describe because I don't know any physical location I would go to find cyclists, to find walkers, to find runners. And if I'm somebody who you know I've been bush running for I don't know a couple of weeks now and I'm looking to up my game, I'm looking for mentorship, I'm looking for people to challenge me. I don't really have that place to go. Like, there are no extra levels, right? You have people who are spending, especially in cycling, multiple thousands of dollars on their gear. And, and that is the way they level up. But there is no path to leveling up from a, um, from a mentorship or from a community perspective. So I feel like if you were to go to just like the top 10 cyclists who are organizing these things for free and say, hey, man, like I see you having a lot of success in your existing meetup, right? Why don't you come up with a new offer where it's a private sort of you know cycling trip, and obviously there's liability and stuff like that. But you know, come up with that offer, and you take a percentage mm -hmm. cut of the revenue generated off that. I think that could be your inroad into what is like these decentralized fitness institutions. 
It's not like a CrossFit yeah. or a gym where there are established business models, established best practices when it comes to building a sustainable business around it. You have this kind of clean slate of people who are doing this on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And you have these experts who have this leadership in these Facebook and Reddit and all these different communities and unbundling them into a paid offering, I feel like would make a lot of sense. Yeah, and it is, um, I think the word um, I've used before, and I didn't know if it resonated, but decentralized fitness, it's a, it's huge. And it's mm. because of that. And I do like the, the premise of that. One of the ideas, well, two quick questions or mm. little mind wanderings are like meetups model. And I'll check more about Mighty Networks. I first thing when I was typing Mighty Networks, the, the second thing was like pricing model, like meetup just has flat rate. So to list other ones have tiered models. Um, yeah. So whether you're bronze, silver, gold, platinum, it's like, I feel like any, anything that I start off with is the bronze model and then you scale it and add features as that of video placement, um, preferential places on search and that I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on that. And it's like, so I'll once, actually once, start with once that you one. Get people, once you get people paying, um, you can integrate hundreds of different upsells. Like once you actually have people come to the network who are making money in some capacity and are now further incentivized to either have a place to add or have any of these things, I, th I think you're getting ahead of yourself trying to think through different upsells. You know, first you have to have yeah. the core business model in place, right? Um, Agreed to know, yeah. And understand your model fluently enough where you know the different levers that you can then pull to then grow that, right? And it even could be like in the model that I described, you know, you have, you know, maybe a free walking class with this teacher, right? You, you let them do the free, free stuff and then say, hey, if you really enjoyed this class, like level it up into these next levels. And I think you give them a way to climb, right? And a very simple nudge is, um, and I know this sounds really simple, but it's very powerful is during that sign-up process, just give them a range of prices. Like as I'm like the expert coming on trying to create my course, it's like, you know, you have an option to just say, hey, people who are building something similar, they're charging $200 a year, right? Just that simple nudge, you know, creates this try-winning experience for yourself, the teachers, as well as your customers. And you could, you could be the marketplace in the middle because there is no institution behind it. That, that seems to me, and maybe I'm completely off base here, and, um, you know, but I, I think this is a viable business model to grow. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think it is a viable model. And I think it's different from your initial, you know, what you were initially saying in the beginning, Sean. I think it's kind of two different angles, one of which is like I'm joining this because I want to level up, you know, yeah. whereas the other one, when you when you said it earlier, didn't you know, that seemed like a possibility, but it wasn't the core use case. You know, like they weren't joining the community to level up, they were just joining to have people to do the thing with. Right? Yeah. And it is um, the case, like I'm thinking of Meetup maybe like too much in the background in terms of like Meetup is for anyone and everyone. It's like, that's yeah. a real community aspect, but mm. it is too broad to begin with because then- For sure. It's like I will invest yeah. in features such as, um, and one of the next things I was playing around with is, um, it's like, do you take on other features of like, you actually do your, your charging and kind of your annual membership through the site, track it, um, tracking people's liability insurance and um, membership fees, whatever. And then it is like, well, if I've, if my niche is people trying to level up from uh, um, hobby to business, well, then those are what get prioritized prioritized on like a product roadmap versus like more more soft things for community building. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, a, cu a couple of things there. Um, you know, what, once you're in the habit of making money and once you have the capacity to in, in, invest in new features, the community can grow those feature sets out with it however you want. I feel like your first focus should be finding a viable model in which you can grow upon and something yeah. that is try winning for yourself, the people leading the communities, as well as the people attending the communities. Um, once you have that foundation, you'll be seeing a lot really pretty. Also, another point you keep on mentioning is the liability insurance. I actually have a friend, um, 
named Matt. We did like this entrepreneurial treat in uh, Nicaragua. I don't know if you met him, but you should. Um, and he has a company called Skipper My Boat, where it's Airbnbs for catamarans and boats. And at the beginning, he had like a bunch of trouble getting people signed up, but his niche and his kind of his unfair advantage in the very beginning was he was insured. Okay, so it was like this fear of like every boat owner of, you know, if a storm comes or like shit hits the fan, which, you know, can do and you're on the open sea, you're not insured. So his inroad to a lot of, you know, many of these, um, even like the marketing material to, to uh, get these guys, a lot of it based on our conversations we had, maybe this didn't play out in real life, but was around the insurance. It was the fact that, hey, you're doing this illegitimately, you're taking on substantial risk, but if you book through my platform, you're insured, which I thought was yeah. such an interesting angle. Yeah, and I mean, this is my hypothesis to test also better. And like, yeah, there's a chance that like some people get lucky that they know it from the beginning or stumble upon. But this was from a guy. So he run, he coaches on behalf of so Salomon, the massive running brand. They have three running groups around two in Australia, one in New Zealand. And the pain in the ass, like every month you have, they send out a link or like you register on Facebook, fill out the same details, emergency contact. I, yeah, I'm not going to sue you if I trip over and break a wrist or something. Right. But it's like they do that every month because as a big company, like that is a massive risk and they're sponsoring it, putting on right. for free and um, paying coaches. So coaches literally write down for free, <laughs> write down in a notepad every month or like get them to sign a physical paper. So yeah, something for me to yeah. like, I'm just saying like what I'm articulating is it's not all about customer acquisition maybe. It's all for me to kind of figure out, but yeah, there are yeah. certain other pain points, especially as you professionalize. Yeah, for sure. I think I agree with Nick in, in that I think the focus should be on, you know, getting that core model down and, and the product. Um, because I think the, the customer acquisition, that's, that's going to come when you have, when you have a good product. And like, I mean, when, like you said, when you get paying customers, there's so many upsells you can do. Right. But I think um, I'd be I'd be really curious to know, A, who you've who you've spoken to, like who have you been speaking to? Because I think like getting the voice of these people is is paramount. Right. Like that's so important just to kind of understand how how can we actually bring value? So that's the first question is, who have you spoken to? And B, um, where where are you currently at with the project? Like, are you still in a in this, is this an idea? Is this, you know, people are on board? Is this, I've, you know, started thinking of some user journeys and I've done 20 customer interviews. Yeah, so playing around with, um, well, in terms of like testing the premise and the like value proposition from a user point of view, it's um, been talking to colleagues, friends, family. So like there's a pain point out there of finding the group. What I need to do more of is talk to the actual group owners. And yes, they're the ones that are going to be yeah. hopefully pinging out their credit card details. So it's like relaying what their customers want. They probably know more than uh, they definitely know more than I do. So it's one of those um, during COVID, we don't have any groups. So I've reached out to a few. Some of them are the coaches rather than the group owner. So I need to scale that up um with regard to where the project is um written out a bunch of user journeys um i had a good catch up with Sai the other day in terms of like following more of a strategic roadmap um and yeah constantly learning reading um figuring that out but have a lot of um the ux ui figma designs um i'm at inspire nine a shared working space here nick um and got four volunteer coders from the wagon so that's been really good so nice. i've uh, nice. i'm paying <laughs> i'm paying for desk space i'm like coming in they're coming in here three days a week actively encouraging them to also not spend the entire day on this so i can't mm. guarantee a a paycheck and a roof over your head so yeah trying nice. trying to build that so it has been like this is what are you after it's like if it's a portfolio piece great if it's literally getting out of the house so you can see another human post lockdown. 
that's been the biggest selling point. I was like, oh, you can yeah. do this at home. You don't, <laughs> yeah. you don't have to get out of your tracksuit pants. They're like, no, get me out of the house. I want to do this or something. So learning and driving, that has been really good. So actually, yeah, pretty much finished setting up the back end. Um, and this is all for setting up the back end of a very much a MVP minimal, yeah. minimal viable product. Sure. And it's like, Eli, you'll know, this is pretty much Airbnb week. You can create a listing, you can edit a listing, you can search and find it, you can join it. Right. So I mean, yeah, that that's a quick and dirty, dirty product um, there. And then like For adding sure. those other integrations are the, yeah, take a take a take a breath and really start um, sharing that. Mm. Yeah, um, man, I, you know, I I feel like you know when you think about like through models, it almost feels like this is like a podium. It, like this approach that I keep on like coming back to Podio allows me to create a course in a very structured way. And oh, we, Podia. Yeah, Podia. Sorry. Yeah. So you know, it, com. it gives me a place where I can like create my online course, charge for it. It's like all encompassed in one platform. My friend Danielle made a course on there, and I almost feel like this could be like the inroad so that you have these existing coaches, right? Probably a couple thousand followers on Instagram. You know, they're a bit of a fitness influencer that they come on, they create the physical event and are able to charge for it and then have people show up to it. I mean, I think that would be such an amazing experience. And when I go to these things, I know I'm going to get quality people. Like, you know, yeah. if, you, if you're going to like a level three running course for the, you know, it's in the mountains. It's like, you want it, you're going to be with some fit, some fit people. Right. Yeah. And it also gives them the opportunity to create different levels, right? Or even like a, a whole of their own user journey of like, uh, I'm someone who's just beginning. I go into level one, two, three, four. That, I feel like that is a journey that a lot of people in fitness kind of imagine going on, but the, the steps are not clear. And the truth mm -hmm. is like once I actually invest money, right? Not just into the gear, right? At the gear and then, you know, I think I leveled up, but it's really actually going through those different levels of that fitness training, I, I feel like that could be a very sustainable niche. And then eventually you could then offer, once they have a paid course with X number of dollars being made, hey, you can now do a free one. You know what I mean? It's it, it like just yeah. keep every interaction on the network very high quality. And, and also, you know, be mindful when you're listening to your social assistant. You know, like everyone who says they, they don't need money, you're not really going after the people that don't have a headache, right? And you're not even after going after the people that have a headache. You're going after the people that migrate, right? Like you have these people who have dedicated their livelihood and their brands to pursuing the specific level of fitness, empower them to turn that into a business, you know, especially during these times. Because a lot of these guys just have the goodwill of their heart and their passion for it, have never had a avenue to politely ask for money and sustainably get that into their own accounts. I, I feel like I, I just, it's something I would do. I know that. Like if you had an acro influencer or someone who's really good at, because I've been looking on Venice Beach. I live in Venice Beach, California, and I would love to have a, a, um, a kettlebell group, for example. But I wouldn't trust just any kettlebell group. Like that's a very specific activity, right? I'd want someone who's an expert. And frankly, I'd like to pay money for it. I'd like to know yeah. that I'm getting that level of quality. I invested a couple hundred bucks in my kettlebell set, so I might as well use it with someone who knows what the hell they're doing, and I know I won't get injured. And if you actually told me you have all this and they have liability insurance, that would be fine. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, like, yeah. okay, so when I, <laughs> when I tear my ACL, I'm good. Yeah, so I think that's the other part, like defining the niche of the group owner, but then leveling and the niche of their their customer. And so, sure. yeah, there are... There are like real good running club coaches, this, that, and the other. I don't know how they get found. Once again, it's um, word of mouth and referral. But guess right. what? If you're new to an activity or new to a city, that's out the door. Um, For sure. So, yeah, I think one of the pain points, <clears throat> sorry, some of the things I'm considering is like a lot of the ones where it is paid and they have, they've leveled up. So it's, um, they've found, They've got a bank balance, they've got paying customers, so they've invested in SEO and a website to be found. But yeah, to be able to act, saying it out loud now, the people that are trying to level up, it can be a very expensive and daunting task. So 
bringing that platform to them. And I do love the idea of um, what's it called, Podia. Um, mm. And yeah, something for me to talk to you about in another week. But I was like, I, I love like YouTube content and like, it's like I've been doing a fair bit, like trying to do some like high altitude mountaineering and it's like, or like yeah. even bike packing, bike packing adventures or like multi-day trail hikes, like the yeah, amount of time and fire. effort, they are like, they are like, that's their life. But guess what? Like they spend months planning a, like an expedition, a journey, a run, a ride. And it's like, they know everything. It's like, I like it, but I don't like it that much. Like, how do I dip my toe in the water? And it's like setting up a platform for like adventure consultants or something. It's like, this was, this is my gear list. I love freaking gear. And like there's outdoor gear lab, which is from America. Like they go through gear and people read it. And it's like, how can you help them monetize their passion? It's like, they spend thousands of hours doing it. And it's like, okay, but YouTube, they get a couple, couple hundred dollars from Facebook ad, or like they don't actually get anything because it's such a niche. Right. People would be yeah. paying, willing to pay a higher amount rather than just relying on like, yeah. But, but even CPM look at the YouTuber, the YouTuber models that are really making bank are the guys who are converting their audiences, at least in the coding space, right? Their audiences to a paid course, right? It's yeah. like you, you, you're offering an avenue for someone to support you. It's like, okay, cool, like I'll go for a hike for you. But even having a firm offer that's calcified in software so that I can get then go and say, hey, this is an offer. That yeah. you, I think that's, I don't know, I think that's a home run. Uh, yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Like it, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> it also gives them a platform to ask for money, right? It's like you have this easy way where you can log in, get that, I don't know, monthly, and or annual subscription and then boom you have access to this whole experience of multi days of just leveling up whatever the hell it is you're passionate about i, I feel like yeah. you're you're going you really want to talk to those guys who have put in their ten thousand hours and ask them right. like, would you be interested in because everybody's making an online course but the truth is that shit doesn't apply to running doesn't apply to cycling these are things where the camera equipment hasn't caught up yet so that you can viably have a live stream or a conversation while you're on a moving on a moving object. So you know you have to get the people there to even be a part of it. But you know it's also then you got to keep inventory, you got to collect money. You get you know are they going to show up and whatnot? And just understanding like and these guys have audiences. Like everyone who's like oh like you want to go hike like go talk to Nick. He's he's smoking weed hiking the mountains somewhere. You know it's like that would be a pretty cool thing if I could build a niche around my favorite physical activity. Yeah. yeah it's sure. interesting because like, I think people have, everyone's caught up and like, there's so much clickbait, like how to make money as an influencer or like how to make money off YouTube. And it's like, unless you're just like selling cosmetic makeup and getting like hundreds of thousands of right. views from bullshit. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Find yeah. your niche charge for that yeah. niche because like I've invested a lot of money to follow that niche. Like you said, a cyclist, like, gear ain't cheap and if you're going hiking and mountaineering like a tent isn't cheap so like yeah. drop in the ocean yeah mm. oh go ahead yeah, I, I, gonna, think I, said, I, I think i said everything i said to say you, you know where my head's going on this so okay. yeah yeah no no i was gonna say i i, I kind of i hear where nick's at with you know i i see how that is a very viable space um and i think yeah. i think that, that's like a little side tension <laughs> You know, I think your next step should be ta finding because you've already spoken to people that, and you've identified the pain point of people can't find community around certain activities, etc. But I think now the next step is to talk to those people who would be the community operators. You know, mm -hmm. find those people who could yeah. be potential community operators because the tech is simple. You know, the tech is simple. Um, so once you once you start talking to these people who are those community operators and you know everything's going to become so much clearer and then the tech is simple enough where you can just start you know trying some beta communities you know and just get a few of them you know get a few of these communities up and running locally right in melbourne um and kind of see how that goes but i think yeah the, the the gap in terms of your yeah in terms of the those insights is talking to those people who would be community owners, community operators, and 
back to Nick's point, I think when you talk about leveling up, that is, I mean, A, yeah, you have people that have put in their 10,000 hours and would love to build a sustainable business around this passion. And now for the other people in the community, it's not, it's no longer a question of our, is our use case leveling up or is our use case community building? But now they're able to build community through leveling up, you know? And it's like the, the community will be intrinsically part of that model if, if, if that use case is on kind of leveling up in a way. Um, but yeah, those are my kind of last yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah. Yo, Sean. Nick, anything else? No, I'm good, man. No. I, think I, I think I've spoken my piece. I appreciate you coming on, man. Um, I hope you got some value out of this. <laughs> no, it's been awesome. Yeah, I uh, appreciate it. I'll let you know where the brain goes. Um, and yeah, like I love business. Um, I wasn't afraid to say that I was one of the worst coders in the boot camp. I didn't go on there to become a software <laughs> developer. Like product management was more of like a, a transition <laughs> or like yeah, to be work in startups like i love the value and con connecting it and it's like often look like how can i grow other people's passions like i, I get more excited about that like mm. i read i follow business i love technology it's like but this is a scalable and sustainable way to do it for on mass so yeah i really like it thanks guys yeah, awesome. I appreciate it, Sean. thanks for coming on man thanks sean cheers guys there have a good one and a happy happy friday when you get there yeah happy four <laughs> i don't know whether it's australia but here it's a thing see ya all right cool well i think it was fun um good talking to you so we're still we're still uh, recording yeah